Hey everyone, I'm Anthony Morrow. And I'm Harley Solbaka. And today we are thrilled to have with us the award nominated and winning creative team behind the industry's hit series, Coda, and the follow up series, Coda False Dawns. Cy Sprayer and Matias Bergara. Yay, we're so excited you guys are here. Yeah, thank you guys so much for joining us. I know we've been wanting to do this for a hot minute, and I'm uh, glad we were able to uh, schedule it. Not even easily, if it's early. Right? I mean, uh, we're, we're scattered all across the planet. We, we are scattered across <laughs> the planet. We have some of us in the late afternoon, evening, some of us midday, some of us very early morning, but we're all here. We're all drinking a beverage. Not that this is a new kind of uh, thought on the series, but in music, Coda is a musical phrase that brings a piece of music to its end. But your wonderfully twisted series has more story left in it than its initial uh, run. So what made you want to come back to the world of Coda? I think we, I mean, I, I won't put words in Matty's mouth, but I think we both just adored it so much. Um, the world, the possibilities of the world, the characters in particular. I mean, uh, the first season, the first series of Coda, um, it posits a, an apocalyptic world. Like, the, to, to give you the spiel, um, Coda is to Mad Max as Lord of the Rings is to our world, right? So it's right. it's a world where formerly it's been dragons and elves and fairies and knights and all of that nonsense, where a world that is functional because of the existence of magic. And then it's all gone wrong. Magic has gone. There's been some dreadful war. The Dark Lords won. It's all been wiped out. And now, as our story begins, we're in the wilderness that exists after this. We're in a world which formerly only functioned because magic existed, and suddenly there's no magic left. What do you do? Um, in our case, we sort of take this incredible world with all its possibilities, and then we focus in on a pair of characters, a husband and wife, um, who are utterly different probably not meant for each other in any way because they're so completely different and yet completely devoted to one another to the extent that they will, in, in one of their cases, lie and cheat and steal, mostly lying and cheating himself, I should add, in order to, to make this relationship work. Um, and just kind of muddle through, like the, 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 the corny phrase that, that sells it every time is, what do you do when the magic's gone? And that's true of the world as well as, as the marriage. And any of us who are in long-term relationships know that it's not enough to have the thrill. You also have to have the love and the connection and the responsibility and the tenacity and the means to just make things work because it's important. And in the first story, it was about these two finding each other and coming together and helping each other and preventing some awful stuff from happening. And it ended on the note of, we just have to muddle through. And they walk off together into the sunset on, on their giant five horned mutant unicorn, <laughs> because that's the sort of thing that happens in Coda. And, and we kind of pined for it. I think we went off and did some other stuff that we're very proud of, but it, it's just gurgled away the world continues to exist when you close the page of that first book. And that's that to me as a, as a world builder, that is the sign of a world that works because it, it works independently of the stories you're trying to tell within it. Right. So it felt stupid not to be going back and looking at <laughs> what's going on. It's like, well, it's just there. They're still there. They're still living their lives. Things are still happening to them. Let's, let's go find out. Um, and we wouldn't have bothered if we didn't have a really great story because there's just no point. I believe in controlling ideas and, and you have to know where something ends before you start telling the story. And we had all that. The story just came together really beautifully. Mm. Um, yeah, I'll stop waffling now. But but the short answer is we love that place and we want to spend all our time there. And why is the second series called False Dawns? What does that allude to? We kind of pitched different possible names uh, based upon the basic premise that there is a huge false moon uh, looming in the skies every day. So um, this is like, it's difficult to describe without giving away the story too sure. early. Yeah. <laughs> without giving the details. But um, obviously, much like the first arc of Coda, the first 12-issue arc, 
um, this world which was destroyed and, and came down falling into pieces. It's now recovering and reconstructing this world of illusions and shadows and all the powers and kingdoms and everything that was constructed that came down crashing during the apocalypse that made everything fall down. Um, also made all the constructions and uh, all notions about life and magic and whatever else also come crashing down. So Ooh. we in Coda um, usually, I mean, we we come back and forth to this this uh, constant topic of uh, moving away the curtains of what is real and what is an illusion. People are trying to to find the difference between uh, power, belief, and reality. I think I, I try not to go too philosophic with this, uh, but it's <laughs> no, do so, it. I love it. it <laughs> I'm in. <laughs> but, uh, on a bigger scale, yes, it's literally about a false fake moon, uh, which is artificial, was created by a, by a spell, which no one knows why is there or why it, why it appeared uh, suddenly in the skies, which creates lots of confusion and lots of opportunities for for bad people to create um, plans and sure. <laughs> and execute. <laughs> And execute and exploit uh, the confusion and the, all these tribes of people who are aimlessly walking around the earth. When you live in a world of confusion and fear and destitution and imperfection, which we all do, yeah. it's very easy for somebody to stand up and say, I've got all the answers and all you've got to do is change everything and follow me and give me all your power and I will lead you into the promised land. And, and that's kind of how every single so-called radical political movement pops up on either side of the political spectrum, religious leaders, economic leaders, you name it. It's all about the propaganda of change. And, right. and yeah. that's very much what's going on. And, and in a funny kind of way, it's like anti-storytelling in as much as both of our characters are trying really hard to just cling to their status quo, the thing that they now know. In Hum's case, it's sitting in his farm and doing as little as possible. In Circa's right. case, it's going off and doing heroic stuff. They're both lying to themselves because this is completely inadequate as, as a life, and yet that's what they're telling themselves they want. They're trying really hard to be passive while the entire world is changing and filling up with liars and charlatans and bullshitters, and they're trying really hard not to get involved. It's like an anti-story. Stories happening over there nothing to do with us stay away stay away and they just get sucked into the story they can't help themselves and they have to start being decisive fantasy and sci-fi anything that's a little genre has a a wonderful pedigree when it comes to allowing us to talk about these metaphors in a way which isn't too preachy and isn't too on the nose and is very entertaining and perhaps more pertinent to this conversation, allow somebody like Matthias to just draw the most incredible things yeah. <laughs> in, order to, in order to kind of give your brain and your eyes the candy to hopefully absorb by osmosis some of these big themes and, and ideas that we're playing with. Absolutely. And speak, speaking of art, I mean, the in False Dawn's one of the first pages with the uh, little fairy goblin that pops up oh my gosh. Uh, decreeing the, the arrival so of the much. new promised king. I think I stared at that for like a good 20 minutes so uh, when we I, first I, saw the so pages. Because just like, this is beautiful and horrible and I want this tattooed on my body somewhere. It's and the just, detail yeah. and like, I wanted it to be like a meme immediately. I was like, we should put this all over the media. <laughs> yes, those, those little flying goblins like uh, were there and they they serve as kind of like um they're a symbol or a metaphor obviously for for the media yeah or for the noise or the constant bombarding of messages that that you receive every day through different forms uh anywhere you go everywhere you might be they will reach to you in the next issues there will be explanations for that and, and besides that part which is your plot and and story I obviously have huge amounts of fun designing things. Yeah, yes. it's it's obvious. <laughs> yes. My goal, at least, is is to, is to try to create the the illusion of a real world beyond that those frames, those little square frames that are panels 
months ago when that first issue dropped, but uh, there's in that first issue, there's a giant war crab with the saddle on it and the saddle oh, yeah. can swivel because crabs can walk in different directions. You need to be able to still yes. look forward every time. And it's, you, you, the, you said it way better than I'm going to paraphrase it, but it was very much just like it's just small world building details like that. Where like, Matthias, you thought about that when you were drawing and like, oh, yeah, you need to be able to this needs to be able to be functional as a war mount. And this is how it becomes functional. I, I just think about these things the whole time. It's it's <laughs> I, I don't know how to define it, but it's kind of a mental state in which you have to fall in. Um, you cannot create a world that is believable unless you actually believe in it. And it's it's got to be functioning, living, and and thriving in your mind at least, in order for you to to come up with ideas that work inside this world. You cannot just say, okay, I will just I interpret the script literally and and do whatever comes to my mind immediately, and that's it. No, you have to like stop and think a bit. For instance, if you have, I don't know, um, a kingdom of people who live off har uh, harvesting metals from a volcano. Uh, where do they take the water? Uh, how do they dress? Uh, what color do they paint their houses? Uh, what, what would you make? What material would you use to create a roof for your house if you live next to a volcano? It cannot be something feeble or, 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 or wood or anything like that. <laughs> you should use iron or stone or something like that, because unless you have that, you will be destroyed by the, you know, the lava or, or, or whatever is happening. And it sounds silly or, or too fantastical or, or too yeah. self-absorbed, but it's actually very important because um, someone else is going to decode that information when they see it. Even if it doesn't make sense immediately, um, the texture of details and information, it's never, uh, uh, it's never useless to the reading experience if it's done right. We, I mean, things like that, experimental projects, they allow, I mean, hell, it's a, it's a cliche, but comics is collaboration. And if, mm. if, if one or the other of you is at the top of your game and the other is not, then it will show. And if you're both at the top of your game, then ideally you end up with something that's greater than the sum of its parts. And and going off and doing something like Step by Bloody Step, which which just to be clear was a fancy story with no dialogue at all, took me right out of my comfort zone, took Matthias right out of his comfort zone, and helped us to, I guess, relearn a lot of discipline, comic narrative, visual narrative, structural formalist discipline, which has only strengthened the way that we work together. Like, I mean, almost any other artist with whom I'm working will describe me as a painfully wordy writer. Like my script is painful. <laughs> <laughs> because I trust my partner on Coda, they don't have to be, because I know that whatever he draws will be yeah. better than what's in my head anyway. So I, I'm extremely proud of almost everything I've ever written, but some of it, my God, it's hard. It's like pissing razor blades, but Coda, it just flows out. And, and that's a sign of the excitement, the sense that um, it's all just there. It sometimes feels like we're telling a story that's already happened, like we're reporting on something, like mm -hmm. chronicling, you know, some sort of gospel of things that exist in in a space that's real. We're not making anything up. We're just kind of reporting it all. And, and that's a weird sensation, quite magical in its way. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's kind of the dream in this medium anyway. To both your credit, um, especially coming off of Step by Bloody Step, when those first pages for uh, issue one of False Dawns kind of came out and with the, with the, included with the announcements and they were unlettered at the time, they were just, you know, colored pages. Super readable. Absolutely. You could just yeah. like, without any of the dialogue, without any of the captions, you knew exactly what was happening. With all of the literal libraries filled with fantasy epics that stretch back to Arturian legend and beyond, um, if you count like myths and cultures and all that stuff. How did you go finding a way to tell a new fantasy epic? Because that is what you guys have done. You've built this amazing brand new fantasy world. I mean, we murdered it. It's that simple. We were oh, like perfect in the sort of the the earliest phases of what eventually became Coda, long before I had anything to do with Matthias. Um, I got so sick of fantasy. I got so sick of it being so po-faced, so self-important, so utterly lacking mm -hmm. in a sense of humor, so 
needlessly granular, like all those endless maps and the explanations for how the spell works and all you need. And there. serious. Yeah, yeah, and it's just, it's nonsensical. Like uh, we were talking before about how you can throw too much detail at the reader. You can throw not enough detail at the reader, but the, what you want is this perfect balance where the world just is We've put all this thought mm. and effort into it, into what the people wear and why they wear them and what their house is made of. We don't need to stop and say so. We don't need three pages yeah. about people saying, well, you'll notice I've built my house out of stone because hey, volcano. <laughs> we decided to kill fantasy. We were like, okay, it's not really working. Let's let's take it. Let's murder it. Let's posit a world where every fantastical cliche is real and then burn it down. Let's just get it done. And then Love let's it. see what happens next. And and that's that's what became Coda. Pentacorn. Why? I mean, it was it was just sort of par for the course, wasn't it? The the whole notion of taking every fantasy cliche and then doing something despicable with it and making it more interesting and, and sort of more more vivacious as a result. We're so used to unicorns being this. Well, there's multiples, aren't there? There's the sort of princess, twinkly, cuddly unicorn. There's the 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 Christian allegory, which I'm not going to get into because I really could talk for hours and hours. <laughs> um, and all he does is swear. It's like he's got the foul mouth. I know, I love him. You expect a unicorn to twinkle or to say beautiful little things, but in fact, all he does is scream curse words at people. Anyway, that was that was the recipe, and I pictured some sort of sleek war horse with five horns and a neat line down the middle of its head, and and that script went to my esteemed <laughs> partner, and and what came back is is just art. Amazing, just amazing. Uh, well, Sai, Matthias, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, will you please tell the good people where you are on the internet? I'm on um, Twitter and Instagram under my name. Um, that's it, pretty much it. <laughs> I don't have a website. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, social media account. I do uh, what used to be Twitter, so I'm at Sai Spurrier, Um And I think that'll that'll find me on all the alternatives as well, your your Instagrams and your blue skies and so on. Uh, I do have a website, simonspurrier.co.uk. Thank you to everybody for listening. And if you haven't already, be sure to pick up the hardcover collection of Coda and all the single issues of Coda False Dawns at your local comic shops uh, for the hardcovers anywhere you can buy books. It's I forget what number it is, but it's right up there at the top of Fantasy Dystopia on Amazon at the moment. So. No, yes, yeah. it is. Yeah, uh, uh, listen to this. It's number one bestseller dystopian graphic novel. Hell yeah. Yes, it is. Hell yeah. I, if you you're in need of a clear definition of what we do, it's dystopian graphic novels. If you're watching this on YouTube. Don't forget to catch the full-length episode in podcast form. The full-length episode in podcast form, I feel like we're funnier because the thing is cut out. Just throwing that out there. It's true. <laughs> it's true. They let me um, be weird. And if you want to stay up to date on all the cool things we have coming down the Boom pipeline for Boom Direct, remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, to our podcast, anywhere you listen to podcasts, and follow Boom Studios on all social media. To close, gentlemen and Harley, uh, in the honor of the nag, let's for 30 seconds just shout expletives into the microphones uh, uh, to make our editor really work for his paycheck this month. I think we're going to have to cut this whole backside oh of this God, it's episode, fine. but it's great. Uh, all right. Remember, everyone, comics are for everybody. Which is why we make comics for everyone. I'm Harley Solbaka. I'm Anthony Morrow. And this, this is, is Boom Direct. 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 Beautiful. We did it. You didn't even wink. <laughs> <laughs>